Okay, as everyone makes their way back from their social distanced chair, it gives me great pride to introduce our next speaker, Dan Staler. Dan has researched wildlife in Yellowstone National Park for years, working mostly with the wolves and the cougars, but with many of the other animals in the project. He's wildlife biologist for the Yellowstone Wolf Project, project leader for the Yellowstone Cougar Project, and Dan is the author of many scientific publications about wildlife in Yellowstone, far too extensive for this list. So Dan, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and turn on. And when you're ready, uh, please feel free to share your screen. All right. Okay, thank you, Jim. Can everyone, can you hear me, Jim? I can hear you well. And your okay. screen's up with an excellent portrait of a cougar looking straight at us and a lot of lichens on the tree. Yeah, it's a beautiful cat. That was just from this last winter here in Yellowstone. Uh, a young male, probably a three-year-old, um, and uh, that was during a capture operation day. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Jim, for organizing for folks to get together and to share knowledge and understanding about uh, some of our more controversial, although charismatic animals that we share this landscape with. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share some of the stuff that we're doing in Yellowstone National Park. So I work for the Park Service, as Jim said. I first arrived here from Vermont back in 1997, and I was, uh, have been fortunate to be able to spend my career as a biologist here with the National Park Service. So it's been a great opportunity. And as Jim said, a lot of my career has been with wolves, but uh, off and on, um, early on, I worked with cougars. I worked, uh, had the opportunity to work with Tony Ruth. Uh, she led the uh, cougar research program here back in 1998 through about 2005. And I worked for her for about a year and a half as a field biologist before returning back uh, in 2002 to work for the Wolf Project, which, uh, and now I've, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to work with both species here, so it's been great. So today I'm gonna share with you just some of the stuff we've been doing in Yellowstone. I do have some videos, and um, if they get too clogged down or hung up, Jim, uh, because of Wi-Fi connection, just let me know and I'll advance beyond them. But uh, we do use remote cameras, and there's a couple uh, slides that I have with some footage that are kind of fun to share if it works out. Um, and so, you know, as Jim alluded to, you know, the cougars are one of the most wide ranging uh, large carnivores in the Western hemisphere, um, you know, ranging all throughout North America into South America. And they're, you know, they're an ancient lineage. Uh, they've uh, been here for hundreds of thousands of years. And there's a lot of really interesting history going on uh, where we're starting to use genetic data to really understand their history in North and South America uh, through time. But they are an ancient lineage, uh, the Thelids, and uh, they've been on this landscape for a long time uh, and they have a rich history here. Um, you know, rarely seen in Yellowstone, uh, you know, they uh, uh, usually people experience cougars through their tracks in the snow, uh, through maybe cover, discovering a kill on the landscape, but they're rarely seen. Uh, and so they're kind of out of sight and out of mind. And, and as a result, we kind of forget about, or some people forget about just how important they are in this landscape as a top carnivore. Now, of course, for the last 25 years, much of the emphasis of understanding carnivores in Yellowstone have revolved around the return of the wolf, a very successful conservation success story with wolves being reintroduced in the mid 1990s. Uh, and there's been a lot of research and interest uh, and passion on all sides of the uh, spectrum uh, involving wolves and, and carnivores in this landscape. Now, if we look at the history of wolves and cougars and, and bears here in Yellowstone, um, we know they've been here for a long time. There's great fossil evidence here. And of course, when the, uh, going all the way back to 12,000 years ago, uh, dated. And of course, when the park was first established, uh, right away carnivores were met with a lot of resistance on the landscape. Uh, there was focused predator eradication uh, going on early in the park's history. Um, in 1914, U.S. Congress actually passed predator elimination laws from all public lands, and it was a very successful campaign through trapping and shooting and poisoning. And, you know, wolves and cougars were eliminated, essentially, by the 1930s. Um, bears persisted. They were sort of under the favor of an earlier superintendent. It was a draw to the public. Um, but wolves and cougars did not face that same uh, interest, uh, and so they were successfully eliminated around the same times. 
you know, there are quite a few cougars that were removed from the park in that early 19, uh, early mid 19, uh, you know, 10 to about 1925. Uh, and so they, they kind of faced that same threat. Uh, cougars came back to the Yellowstone ecosystem in the 1980s uh, in terms of establishing a population. Um, you know, it's an interesting history about cougar eliminations from the landscape. Uh, and then there was bounties on cougars through much of the 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. And then a lot of the Western states uh, eliminated those bounties in the 1960s and 70s. And cougars became a trophy game animal. And it was actually through hunting and sportsman interest in preserving cougars that actually uh, led to the success of the return of much of the landscape. So they have an interesting history in that regard. And if anyone knows any houndsmen who are passionate about cougars, they'll know that they're some of the most uh, passionate people about wanting to see cougar conservation on the landscape and often are the ones advocating for more protections for cougars. Um, some people not, might not realize that relationship between a lot of people that are interested in cougars on the landscape and, and actually part of the sportsmen's groups that advocate for their conservation. Uh, so that's an interesting part of their history being brought back. Of course, when cougars were, re or when wolves were introduced in the 1995, mid 1990s, uh, cougars were already increasing in their abundance. Grizzly bears, black bears were thriving as well. So we can fast forward today in 2020 and see Yellowstone landscape as being one of the more carnivore rich periods of Yellowstone's history in, in over 100 years. So uh, a lot of great success stories there. You know, these images uh, depict much of how we view cougars on the landscape, carnivores, uh, wolves. Um, you know, there's a lot of ecological naivety of their viewed as a threat to a way of life, uh, whether you raise livestock or wanted to procure food from the landscape from hunting uh, ungulates. And so this was their fate uh, in Yellowstone as it was throughout much of uh, North America. And the return of carnivores to this landscape really in, in many ways one of the one of the main objectives is to restore this image here and that is the act of predation. We know that predators play an important role in the functioning of ecosystems, how food webs, how energy is transferred through food webs and their influence on how ecosystems function uh, cannot be uh, 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 underappreciated uh, and so the restoration of carnivores to the Yellowstone landscape is very much trying to bring back this role of predation and its importance on the landscape. And of course, cougars join, join a suite of other large carnivores here, as I mentioned, and collectively, you know, these animals are incredibly important to uh, this region. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to live in a landscape with all of them here once again. Um, you know, because they are predators and because they kill things to make a living, it predisposes them to a lot of uh, the symbolism and human biases and, and values that we place on these animals and, and the role they, they play in the ecosystems. And, and because of that, there's a really well-developed mythology about carnivores. Um, I would say much more about bears and wolves than cougars. Cougars still, I think because they're rarely seen, have this uh, mystery about them. Uh, often that mystery can get translated into fear and misunderstanding, just like it does with wolves and bears, of course. Um, and uh, the mythology of bears and wolves in, in some ways makes them somewhat more, uh, I guess, accepting of them, uh, the conflict of them. Cougars seem to evoke this really fascinating sort of fear response uh, when they're seen or, or thought to be living amongst us, uh, but they're very much part of the landscape uh, as these other carnivores. Now, of course, when we look at carnivores in the Yellowstone National Park, we have to appreciate, like all our wildlife, that Yellowstone National Park represents the core of a much larger ecosystem. Uh, you know, these, these species don't uh, um, adhere to necessarily boundaries and they move across these landscapes depending on their home range and movement patterns. Of course, Yellowstone is unique in that it is a large protected preserve uh, and is managed under the National Park Service's mission of preservation. And when species across that go across that boundary, they're then subject to the missions of the states that manage wildlife uh, under the goals of conservation. So they're different, uh, conservation preservation have different uh, roles on the landscape and, 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 uh, and can affect species in different ways, but collectively, uh, you know, carnivores living in the park uh, will roam in and out of that protected preserve. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, when they leave the park, that is where we tend to uh, find more conflict, challenges to coexisting with carnivores uh, on the landscape. Part of the success of carnivores in the Elson region, of course, is our large uh, abundance and diversity of food for these animals. Um, cougars are primarily uh, dependent upon ungulates like elk and deer, um, and they will occasionally uh, uh, hunt bighorn sheep and even pronghorn in our landscape, as well as a suite of much smaller prey animals ranging from marmots to uh, red foxes, coyotes, grouse, um, and uh, we've even had some of our cougars kill beavers in Yellowstone. Uh, so they really are opportunistic, but largely dependent on deer and elk for success. Now, much of what we see in Yellowstone for uh, cougars occupying the landscape is the northern range is the best cougar habitat in the park, and it, and it provides year-round uh, habitat for cougars. What we see uh, seasonally is cougars using Yellowstone throughout. There's probably few places in the park in the summer months where cougars aren't roaming, but in wintertime, because they're primary prey, deer and elk are migrating out of that uh, challenging winter landscape of the park's interior. They're moving outside the park uh, to the east, the west, the south, uh, and the northern range does represent our year-round cougar population. And therefore, that has been the focus historically for cougar research. We really know very little about how many cougars occupy the interior of Yellowstone. We have very good information about cougar numbers on the northern range because of the research that's been done over the years, but we know much less about cougars in the interior. But I've encountered tracks throughout the park, all the way down in the thoroughfare, Hart Lake. Of course, there are cougars coming in, probably West Yellowstone, that Madison River corridor, even in the winter months as well. But most other places in the interior in the wintertime are void of cougars. Uh, there's a, actually a pretty rich history of cougar research in Yellowstone. And this was started in the uh, late 80s, uh, from 1987 to 1993. Carrie Murphy did some incredible work here as part of the first work uh, to understand cougars uh, recolonizing the park. Um, his methods, he worked with a prominent cougar biologist named Morris Hornocker, that was his advisor through the University of Idaho. And uh, track surveys were being done in the early 80s as reports of cougars coming back into the park were being documented and uh, Kerry initiated his study in 87. Uh, this early work involved a lot of radio collaring. That at the time was the best tool to study mountain lions, the ability to uh, uh, find and follow uh, the food habits to record numbers uh, really was uh, best uh, accomplished through radio collaring. So uh, typically what's done with mountain lions is you work with a houndsman who has trained dogs to tree a cougar. Once the cougar's in the tree, you dart it. Uh, Collar on it, and then you can follow it. So there was a lot of radio telemetry being done in Kerry's uh, uh, period of time, and he documented between 15 and 22 cougars using the northern range of Yellowstone. His study area included north of the park line out of Gardner, all the way up towards uh, Yankee Jim Canyon, you know, Sphinx Creek, Cedar Creek, that country, all the way back down to the park line. Um, this was a period of time, remember, before wolves were back on the landscape and incredibly high elk density, so it's a, a perfect landscape for cougars to come back on to the park. Uh, his study ended in 93, and then in 1998, uh, Tony Ruth came in, uh, also working with Morris Hornock. Well, that was the one I participated in in the early 2000s, and she, her main goal was to understand how cougars were faring after the return of the wolf. It was a important question to understand how did this landscape with two top predators function and what uh, importantly uh, was the impact of wolf recovery on cougars. Well you can just see by the numbers there that cougar numbers increased during this period of time and this was despite high wolf densities increasing grizzly bear densities because of conservation efforts there and there were still relatively high elk densities during that time so essentially this landscape had a lot of food and still space adequate for these carnivores to coexist and Tony documented um, uh, some really fascinating, which ended in 2006. Then there was a gap in research, uh, and in 2014, we, the park, started back up the cougar study. You know, and our primary motivation was to really understand wolf impacts on prey and how 
wolves were influencing this ecosystem, we couldn't ignore the fact that we had this other top predator, the cougar out there. And so we initiated this study, which I'll be going into much more detail here uh, momentarily on. And our population estimates during this period of time where we did our intensive track surveys and genetic work was 34 to 42 cougars. I'll talk about that more. Um, again, with Tony's work, like Carrie Murphy, um, much of her work involved radio college. At times, both Carrie and Tony had what they believed was over 80% of the population marked with radio collars. And this was still the best tool at the time to count lions, to study their food habits. So uh, that was an important part of their work. I will mention, if you're not aware of this, Tony Ruth did publish, a lead a, a, a effort to publish a book. It just came out last year called the Yellowstone Cougars. And again, this is an incredible book to document both Carrie Murphy's work and her work to understand what was the influence on uh, the return of the wolf to cougars. And uh, there's a lot of wealth of uh, information in this book. It's a, a richly detailed scientific story uh, about the Yellowstone Cougar. So if anyone has, has a chance to get their hands on this book, I highly recommend it. So our Northern Range study area is depicted here on this map. And what you see here, these red lines represent survey routes. And what we did in 2014 is we decided to embark on an effort to count cougars using a slightly different method than radio collaring heavily. And during Tony's work, uh, a graduate student, Mike Sawaya, did a really neat study to start looking at, can we collect DNA from the landscape non-invasively left behind by individual cougars as they move around uh, in order to count them. And so Mike Sawaya developed this group survey grid where they did track surveys. This was in 2004 and five, I believe. And they basically went out and they tried to collect DNA from lions on the landscape, uh, from hair left in bed sites, uh, hair caught up on natural hair snags like sticks and branches, uh, scat at kill sites and they were able to do lab work to identify unique genetic individuals. And what Mike Sawaya demonstrated was the ability to document about 70 to 80% of the individuals known to be out there from radio colored. So it was sort of a proof of concept to show how effective non-invasive surveys can be to count a cryptic animal like a mountain lion. So we modeled our work after Mike Sawaya's work and we basically put out all these survey routes that between 2014 and 2017, we did these intensive snow tracking surveys. We'd uh, uh, repeat each survey each week over the course of 10 weeks in the winter and the goal of con uh, collecting genetic uh, samples from individuals. And so we would uh, go out there on the landscape, uh, we look for tracks, we'd follow those tracks until we found bed sites, uh, scrape sites with scat. Uh, uh, you can see a picture down here in the lower right hand corner of hair caught up on a branch. Um, if a cougar sits in the snow, you can leave hair behind. And a single follicle of hair uh, could potentially provide enough DNA that you can genetically identify that unique individual. Now anyone that's spent time in cougar country knows how rugged and uh, uh, challenging it is to move through. That leads in many ways to the cougar's success. And so our track surveys went through some of that most rugged country in the northern range of Yellowstone, which largely uh, uh, ranges from uh, the outlet of Bear Creek, where it confluences the, Yellow, you know, the Yellowstone River, all the way out into Lamar Valley. Uh, throughout that whole area, the Black Canyon of Yellowstone is some of the richer cougar habitat in the park. And we would track lions to bed sites, we'd collect hair from the bed sites, put them in envelopes, and they'd be sent off to the lab to be genotyped. And throughout this effort, we conducted 635 surveys, almost 9,000 miles of traversing the winter landscape. And about 50% of our surveys, we detect uh, samples and, uh, and collect it. And over this time period, we collected 833 DNA samples. Now, hair and scat left behind on the landscape uh, can provide a viable source of DNA, um, but there are some challenges. Um, you know, just because you get a hair sample doesn't mean you always get genetic uh, DNA amplified. Uh, freeze thaw, uh, UV radiation, all of these can degrade DNA. And so you collect a lot of samples and hope that you get enough individuals detected from that. 
Um, you can see here that from hair, we get about 20% of the hair samples we collected amplified with usable DNA to identify an individual. Scat was a little bit better. Occasionally, we'd find blood in the track of a cat, usually probably because it would cut itself on crust or a rock, leave a little bit of blood. And of course, blood is a, is a richer source of DNA. So that's how we went about collecting samples. What you see here on this map is our points of unique individuals genotype throughout that four winters of surveys. And you can see the concentration through the Black Canyon between Gardner and Hell Roaring Slope, which is right about here. Um, but we did have individuals moving all the way out towards Pebble Creek, uh, up in Tower Creek. And these are unique males and females. The males are depicted by squares. Uh, the circles represent the females. And these are all uh, age classes. We cannot, from a DNA sample, you cannot age an individual. You can sex it and decide, tell if it's a male or female from the DNA, but you cannot identify the age. But we were able at times to link the size of a track in a hair sample, for example, to a kitten or a subadult versus an adult. So there is some effort to discern age, but it can be very challenging with these non-invasive sampling techniques. And from this effort, we were able to, to identify 39 unique individuals on the landscape, 20 females, 19 males. And the average detection of an individual was about, we detect an individual on average two and a half times uh, over that study period. And that this sort of approach to collecting is really strengthened by your probability of detecting individuals over and over again through time, gives you more accurate population estimates. Then what we do is we take this genetic uh, detections of individuals and we do a modeling effort uh, called seeker modeling, spatial capture recapture modeling. And Colby Anton was uh, just successfully completed his PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, he's working on a paper with us now to publish these results. Uh, but I want to give a shout out to Colby Anton, who did an incredible job leading the effort here to help us understand how many cougars are on the landscape. And it took a lot of uh, intensive field work and, and uh, a lot of uh, very sophisticated mathematical modeling to come together. But what we do is we take these individual genotypes, we work with data from our remote cameras and track data. We understand home range, average home range sizes for males and females from some of our GPS collar data. And then we can also see how the effects of our effort to sample and what the snow conditions were like. We bring this all into a mathematical model and it spits out a population estimate that is believed to be a very, uh, accurate representation of how many individuals are on the landscape. And so these methods allow us to measure density, the number of individual cougars per uh, unit of area, uh, as well as the overall abundance across the northern range. We can actually measure through time annual survival and recruitment rates and population growth rates. And we can also identify family groups through uh, uh, paternity, uh, pedigree relationships, similar to what we've done with wolves in Yellowstone. And all of this work is ongoing. And let me just share with you some of these results from these models. Uh, we came up with abundance measures across the northern range throughout these four years of between 34 and 42 cougars. And again, this is all age classes. Um, and the breakdown was 22 to 23 females, 12 to 19 males. And this came up with a density of about 1.9 to 2.3 cougars per 100 kilometers square. Um, if you look at the area of the Northern Range within the park, it's about a thousand. Uh, so that means from about the park entrance uh, in Gardner out to Lamar Valley, this is, means about 19 to 23 individuals on average throughout this four year time period, um, which is a very uh, comparable to what was uh, found from Tony Ruth during her period of time. What you see over here on the bar graph is uh, that measures of density, and you can see our population uh, appear to have been stable, if not slightly increasing throughout that time period. And what we can do is measure what's called apparent survival. And what Tony Ruth and Carrie Murphy did is it looked at annual survival rates of their radio collared individuals, and that was usually around 80 to 85 percent annual survival rate, uh, meaning you had about an 80 uh, cougar had an 85 percent chance of surviving from one year to the next. Our apparent survival is a little bit different metric because not only does it uh, record how many individuals we think are surviving, but it also represents individuals that are probably dispersing out of the landscape. Yellowstone is very much a source population uh, for, of cougars throughout the surrounding regions. Because cougars are hunted outside the park, Yellowstone probably is spitting out both males and females, particularly males, out onto the landscape that will disperse outside the park. 
And so our parent survival rate looks lower than what Tony and Carrie did, but it's because it incorporates not only deaths, but dispersals. And overall, our growth rate was about 1.06. Anything above one is a positive growth. Anything below one would be a negative growth. So we essentially saw a very stable population throughout this four-year survey. And it, this graph just shows and compares our population of cougars uh, across the, the three phases of research. Down here, 1987 and 93, Kerry Murphy's work. Uh, again, this was a population that was recolonizing and on the increase, there was a gap in research here. Tony Roos period here uh, showed a higher abundance on the Northern Range, again, because of the high elk uh, presence here probably, despite wolves return. And then this graph is actually a little bit incorrect. This, these numbers should be down a little bit. It's very comparable to Tony Ruth's uh, numbers, but a slightly higher density. But it is important to, to make note that our methods for counting cougars was different, uh, didn't rely on as much radio collaring. So uh, we believe these are very comparable density estimates, but just important to point that out, uh, that uh, the, the methods used to count lines is slightly different. And what this data allows us to do is then come up with what we call a density map across the northern range. And essentially here what you're seeing is the higher densities of lions are depicted by the red, uh, the warmer colors such as the reds and orange. And uh, as predicted, the black hand of the Yellowstone has our highest concentration of cougar densities. And I will note that this is winter occupancy. Winter, what happens in Yellowstone in the winter is our, our ungulates migrate to the northern range uh, and we have lower snow uh, depth on the northern range. So it's a great place for the, the food source of cougars and therefore we get that congregation of mountain lions down into these lower elevations of the Northern Range, um, particularly in the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone. There's still cougars occupying out to the east in Lamar Valley, uh, and a little bit south to where up in the Tower Creek drainages, um, and uh, they're just at lower densities. We also use remote cameras out there on the landscape, and that's been a really powerful tool to study uh, cougars, uh, just because they are so secretive. And I think later today, you'll see some wonderful stuff from both, both of the Brads. Uh, out there sharing what they've been doing with camera technology as well. It really has provided us an opportunity to learn so much more about these secretive animals. Um, you know, we use remote cameras. Uh, uh, most of ours are just, uh, you know, over-the-counter remote cameras. The Browning camera model we've been really embracing over the years, high-definition video. Um, they're great usability for scientists in the field. Uh, to study these secretive animals. Sometimes we use higher end camera systems like this photo here. Um, this is a, an adult male that was associated with one of our radio collared females for a couple days uh, as a mating couple. And uh, lo and behold, 90 days later, she had kittens. That's the gestation period roughly for a mountain lion. Um, typically with mountain lions in Yellowstone, you see birthing pulses in the summer months. They're different from wolves. Uh, female wolves come into heat once uh, a year, usually in midwinter in February. And uh, after about a 60, 63 day gestation period, they, they give birth to a litter of pups. Cougars, female cougars actually go through an estrus cycle once a month and theoretically could be bred any time of the year. They have a slightly longer gestation period. And so kittens are born roughly 90 days later. And what you see in Yellowstone is we've had litters born at all times of the year uh, throughout the monitoring, sometimes in the middle of winter, but you tend to see a birthing pulse in the summer months, May, June, and July most commonly. And this is uh, uh, because this is abundant food source opportunity for a mother feeding young kittens. Uh, in June and July, there are young uh, elk and deer calves out, uh, deer fawns and elk calves out on the landscape, which is an easier way for them to feed and provide food for their growing offspring. Uh, I think this next one is a series of video uh, of a female that we've been studying for years. This is before we collared her, and here she is with a couple of her young kittens. Um, she's an interesting cat. She's been on the landscape for a long time. We can identify her because she has a some sort of a hernia or a cyst on her stomach and a slightly stubby tail, and so we've been documenting her um, throughout the time uh, uh, that we've been doing our research. Um, she has two young kittens in these videos here. This is from 2019. And young kittens will stay with their mom for up to two years. Uh, if you see the mom here, you'll notice she has a bad injury on her rear right leg. You can see her limping. It almost looks like it could be broken. This is probably an injury she got during the hunt, uh, but we're happy to say it has fully healed. Um, and so it just shows the amazing resilience of these wild animals out there in the landscape. 
and she still, uh, during this time period, this is this last January, um, still has two of her offspring with her. Uh, and then this winter we collared both her and her, uh, one of her female offspring. And that female offspring is now dispersed and on her own. She's two years of age now, that's her in the front. And you can see right now what those cats are doing is the layman behavior where they smell the ground, they're interpreting the scent of probably another lion. And, um, and they have these special organs in their nose that help them detect scent, uh, pheromones and uh, uh, things like that from other individuals. And they learn a lot about their surroundings through scent communication. Uh, and so she's a fascinating animal. We think she's probably, oh, seven or eight years old. She's probably raised quite a few litters in her time. Here she is in the front, followed by a radio collared male. Uh, this is a breeding couple. And interestingly, her young son is still following somewhat sheepishly behind, uh, probably not quite allowed to hang out with uh, uh, her and the male. And that might be his father, actually. And so that's kind of an interesting sequence there of individuals together. And we use cameras to document uh, kind of these really nice life history stories that we recognize individuals through time, either because we have them collared or they have some distinguishing feature. So even though our work has relied on non-invasive techniques to count lions, we still put out some GPS collars to study predation and multi-species interactions. So we have a permit from the park. Each year we go out, uh, we currently have seven GPS collared lions on air right now. Um, and we've collared 16 lions since we started this work in 2015. Uh, we work with a local houndsman that has fantastic dogs that allow us to safely and effectively capture lions. We tree them. We dart them once the drug takes effect. We get up in the tree and, and uh, hook the lion up to ropes, bring it down to the ground safely so we can then put on a collar. Uh, we take measurements. We collect blood for disease and genetic sampling. Um, and that's been our primary method to study predation patterns and multi species interactions. And we get this wonderful data from the GPS collars that looks like this. These different colors represent different individual lions. And our collars collect points uh, every three hours. Uh, this time of the year, they're collecting uh, a GPS location every hour around the clock. So we really have a rich data set. Uh, these are satellite collars that uh, send us data. And then we can work with the data to uh, do a whole uh, series of uh, different scientific questions. We get great data on their home range size. This just gives you an example of some of our uh, radio collar data from a couple years ago showing the home range size. These are female home ranges, F212. This is F210 and her daughter. Uh, F209, I mean, is the mother and F210 is her daughter. Here's a male, has a slightly larger home range overlapping multiple females. And there are differences between male and female lions. Males are territorial, so they establish a home range that they actively defend from other males. Their goal is to secure the breeding rights uh, and access to multiple females. Female lions are not territorial. They have home ranges that uh, overlap with other females. It's often a, a situation where a mother's home range overlaps with her daughter's once her daughter disperses and establishes a home range. Um, the females, young females will disperse further away, but young male lions disperse much further away. Uh, as this map will show. So here's one of our females. We collared her when she was still with her mother, female 210, and she's established her home range overlapping with her mother's home range, which is this circle. Uh, in contrast, here's a young male we collared in 2016, and he left his mother. Uh, he made his first kill by himself in May of the year. Then he moved up, up Slough Creek, made another kill. And then he moved on out. This is very common pattern for young male lions. They will disperse further away from where they were born. And that is a evolved strategy to avoid inbreeding with their close relatives, their mothers and their sisters. And he dispersed out, up the Lamar, out into Sunlight Basin, established his territory out here, but unfortunately was killed uh, during the lion season out there. Um, and that is often the fate of young male lions when they disperse into a new area. If they're going into an area where there's human hunting, they will sometimes get killed, but they'll also get killed by a territorial male. Uh, but sometimes they become the new territorial male. So it's a different dispersal strategy between males and females. Uh, we also get great data from our GPS collars on multi-species interactions. And so uh, this next series of maps will kind of go into how we use some of the GPS data from our wolves and our cougars and, and to study their interactions. So 
This purple circle here is the home range of a female lion, female 207. And you can see her home range overlaps with the territories of two wolf packs during this period. This is the Crevice Lake wolf pack, and this is the Eight Mile wolf pack. And what we were able to do is piece together these really interesting stories uh, of not only wolves and cougars, but just multi-carnivore interactions. And that's a big question that we have here is how do these carnivores uh, coexist and, and what is the nature of their competition? Um, and, uh, and so we can piece together these stories from our rich uh, GPS data set. So um, for example, we'll start here at number one. Uh, this was during a, a predation sequence on this female where we were studying how often she was killing, what she was eating. So here we documented where she killed an adult female elk. This was in early May a couple years ago, right around this time of the year. Uh, actually, uh, on this very day, uh, three years ago, she killed an adult female elk off the road on the way up uh, to Washburn. And she was chased off by a bear. We know this because when we went in the uh, days later, we had uh, bear data there. There was actually a bear, or bear sign there. There was still a bear on the carcass. And we followed her points and we could see where she had moved off that carcass and was, that was stolen by the bear. Cougars are subordinate usually to bears and definitely to wolves when their kills are discovered. And so she moved off and then she went on to kill another elk. That was also taken over by a bear. She got to feed on that for a couple days. She went back and forth and then she moved on and killed an elk calf, fed on that and she got all of that herself. And so this story here depicted by this map kind of just shows you typically what's going on this time of the year is cougars will make a kill and bears are out there looking for food. Just, you know, now elk calves are out on the landscape. Bears are gonna be focusing on elk calves, but before elk calves and deer fawns are available, bears coming out of hibernation are often stealing food from other animals, particularly cougars in this sense. And, uh, and it doesn't take much pressure from a bear to cause a cougar to abandon its kill and move on. This is a story about the interaction that 207 had then with the Crevice Lake uh, wolf pack in March of 2018. We were doing our winter study during this time period. And so we found where 207 killed an elk. She fed on it. She had a kitten with her during this time. And we believe the wolves came in. And since this interaction, we no longer saw a kitten with her. So we believe that the Crevice Lake wolves killed her kitten. And then she went on to kill um, another elk nearby and eventually left. So this is a story of uh, uh, competition between wolves and cougars that can sometimes lead to mortality of young kittens that are more vulnerable. Uh, and this is a real challenge that cougars face when they interact with wolves, particularly females with young. Of course, they've developed strategies to avoid conflict with wolves. They will often avoid areas where they think wolves are gonna be traveling steeper, rougher terrain. Uh, of course, cats can get up in a tree. You know, our ability to capture lions using hound dogs is, is, is because of the evolutionary relationship between wolves and cougars that have existed together on the landscape for hundreds of thousands of years. Cougars going up into a tree is a safe response for them to get away from the threat of wolves, but it doesn't always work. And then 207, again, this is a couple years after we had been following her. We put a new, a new collar on her in uh, March of 2019, early March. And here's a story of her going up into the upper headwaters of Black Hill Deer Creek. Uh, she killed the bull elk by herself, which is an impressive feat. Uh, probably it was in March, deep snow. And she was in an area of a lot of burned off uh, forest regeneration. There wasn't a lot of standing trees. She killed this bull elk and fed on it off and on over the course of two weeks. During this time, she went over and killed a porcupine and fed on that, came back. And then uh, unfortunately, the eight mile wolf pack traveled through. It probably smelled the carcass, came in, and they were able to chase her down and kill her. This was an area where there was not a lot of refuge for a cat to get up in a live tree. This was a burned off area. Uh, there were no cliffs nearby and she had no way of uh, getting away from the wolves. So again, it, you know, here's a cat that spent her couple years of her life living in a rich carnivore area, dealt with competition from bears, ultimately lost one, uh, her kitten to a pack of wolves, and then ultimately lost her life to another pack of wolves. And this is very much the story of carnivore competition. Um, other cats are much more successful and can spend a long life on the landscape uh, despite the presence of wolves and bears. So um, this is part of what we are trying to understand of how these animals interact. We also use GPS collars to understand the interactions between uh, uh, not only the carnivores, but how do their main prey, elk, deal with predation risks. So we had this really 
uh, great research going on um, where we look at GPS movements of elk, cougars, and wolves simultaneously to understand uh, how elk respond to the threat of these species. And so this little infographic, I'll just kind of go through this. And we published a paper not too long ago kind of describing in from the mid 2000s on how GPS collared elk do survive and can be resilient to the threat from multiple carnivores. And that is because what we find typically is cougars in Yellowstone are primarily hunting during the nighttime and uh, they're typically hunting in, in forested steeper terrain. Wolves tend to be more crepuscular and that means active during, during dawn and dusk and using the GPS data and of course any of you who have watched wolves here do tend to see that same pattern. Um, they're primarily hunting during those dawn and dusk hours. And so that begs the question, well, how do elk deal with these two carnivores that are active at different times of the day? Um, do they pick up on that? And do they choose and select habitats uh, to avoid predation risk at different times of the day? This chart down here in the lower left-hand corner kind of shows you activity patterns. This black line here shows where uh, the movement rate from GPS collars are showing that cats are moving more actively in the night. This is after midnight right here. And then there's a lull in the middle time of the day. And then it picks up again uh, after dark. Whereas wolves are more morning area and then towards the end of the day, dawn and dusk. So they have slightly different, we call it dale activity patterns. And, and, and so what that means is it creates parts of the landscape at times where an elk can successfully find food let's say it wants to go feed in an open grassland area, they're gonna find these vacant, we call them vacant hunting domains where they can go safely uh, eat uh, and avoid predation risk. Of course, not all elk avoid predation risk and cougars and wolves both can still successfully kill elk. But what our GPS data showed is that elk are responding to these activity patterns of cougars and wolves that use the landscape differently and hunt at different times of the day and elk are able to respond to that and it really demonstrates the resiliency of elk on this landscape. Uh, and, it, and it reflects a long evolutionary history of these animals coexisting. And, and that is why generally you won't see a landscape, even with both cougars and wolves uh, on there, you, you won't see elk uh, uh, going extinct because they're able to respond to this predation risk that is predictable between these two carnivores and how and where they hunt. Of course, then that leads us to one of the main questions of that we're understanding the food habits of cougars on this landscape. And what we've learned is they do primarily feed on elk and deer, but they will also feed on other ungulates such as bighorn, pronghorn, and a host of small prey. Uh, we have yet to detect cougars hunting bison or taking down bison. I'll talk a little bit probably why that is in a second. We also know that cougars have a higher per capita kill rate uh, than wolves do. And, uh, and that has to do a lot in how they are solitary. Uh, part of that higher per capita kill rate can be explained at times by displacement by bears and wolves. Uh, when a bear or wolf takes over their kill, that forces cougars to go on and have to kill more frequently uh, than they would otherwise. Um, but as a result, you know, cougars do play a really important role in how uh, these systems function. A little bit about hunting behavior of, of cougars. You know, cougars are what we call an ambush hunter. They stalk their prey and they make a powerful pounce. They're not jumping out of trees, down on the back. They're not jumping off boulders like the movies would predict. They're hunting from the ground. They're stalking, they're waiting and watching. And they come up, that big powerful tail is, serves as a ballast. They have really powerful muscles. They have, uh, have specialized tools to kill. Uh, their teeth um, are really long, their canines, very powerful jaws, very powerful bite force because of the musculature on their, on their heads. They have these claws that come out, retractable claws, um, and they have what's called supinating wrists or limbs. They can rotate, um, which is very different from a wolf that has a fixed locked in uh, uh, wrist bones. Cougars can rotate and, and combine. This gives them a very effective way to stalk pounce quickly with a big surge, grab on. And with an elk or a deer, they're usually at the throat, I mean, or the top of the neck. They use their claws to dig in, probably try to flip to get the animal off its feet with their powerful muscles that they can deliver that killing blow. They're able to either sever through the spinal column and find those gaps, or they can uh, uh, puncture through the throat and, and grab on and kill the animal that way. It's a very impressive feat for an animal that's killing something five times its size all by itself. Average female size in Yellowstone is about 100 pounds. 
Uh, an adult male can be up to 160, 170 pounds. Um, it's very challenging for them to kill, but we believe they're much more successful at it uh, per effort than wolves are. And I'll talk about that in a second. This, I just wanna point out this individual lion here. This is a male we have on the landscape. We've had him collared for a couple years now. His number's M211. We call him Snaggletooth because this lower tooth sticks out of his mouth. When we see him on camera, he has a little tooth coming out of his bottom jaw. His top canine is missing. We believe it's an injury from a hunt where his jaw got broken, maybe from a kick from, a, from an elk during a takedown, and his canine's broken out. Yeah, he's still a very successful lion. He's one of our, uh, our main territorial males right now in the northern. So this is Five in contrast. Five minutes there, Dan. Five okay, minutes. this is in contrast to wolves. Five minutes, thanks. This is in contrast to wolves. They're coursing hunters. They hunt by getting their prey to run. They don't have retractable claws. They can't rotate their wrists. All they have is their mouth to grab on. And so it's a very different hunting style. And they do hunt in groups as well, which is different. But collectively, this is why wolves are much less efficient hunters than, than cougars are. The other thing cougars do when they kill is they cache their food, they hide it, and that is to protect it from, uh, to, from being discovered by scavengers. It keeps the smell down. In the wintertime, by burying it in snow, it can keep the meat insulated from freezing. And of course, a lot of scavengers do benefit and utilize cougar kills on the landscape. And so cougars do quite well in concealing their kills, but it's not a perfect situation. They still will have biomass loss to, to scavengers. Here's just one of our collared males. He has a mule deer cached here. And uh, here he is just getting ready to feed on it. He's looking around probably for scavengers coming in. We do cluster predation work because of our GPS collars so we can identify locations where the lions have spent a lot of time and then we hike in a week later once they've utilized it and the bears have gone if there's bears around and we can collect prey remains and here's just images of the diversity of their diet porcupines cougars are very good porcupine killers um, we detect porcupine kills every year from we see a porcupine they find them and they're effective at killing them mule deer elk calves bighorn sheep and just food habits between our three study periods. In the early years, elk, you can see here, was the primary food. In our current research, we see much, like, much less elk use and much more deer use. And this probably reflects fewer elk than in the early years because of our elk herd has come down. Uh, and you can see the diversity of their food in their diet here. So that's an interesting dynamic that we've seen a change in their habitat or in their, uh, the proportion of their diet made up by deer. Right now, of course, elk calves are gonna be a big primary food source for them on the landscape. Uh, and so our cougars will really start focusing on finding these newborn elk calves and then deer fawns in a couple weeks. Real quick, just to kind of finish this off, you know, cougars are part of a multi carnivore system. Our elk counts that we do on the Northern Range show high elk numbers from the 60s all the way up into the 90s. Uh, and of course, wolves are reintroduced here. Many people believe the decline in elk is all due to wolves. Uh, what our data show very nicely here is that we have a multi-causal effect. Not only do wolves play a role, and they certainly do in this elk decline story, uh, but increasing cougars, grizzly bears, black bears, which are all effective elk calf hunters, increasing bison, which compete for elk. Had a heavy cow harvest from 1976. They finally suspended that in 2009. Uh, and then we've had severe winters and severe droughts, but all collectively, the story of the decline of elk is not due to just wolves, but a multi-carnivore system, human hunters, uh, biological effects of climate, and competition with other ungulates out there. But you can see our elk herd is stabilized, and we believe, uh, you know, what we see now on the landscape is probably, you know, eight to 9,000 elk in the northern range herd, uh, despite a high carnivore abundance. Finally, just to end here, um, we are using accelerometer collars. These are sophisticated GPS collars that allow us to document activity patterns of cougars. Uh, what they are is essentially like a built-in Fitbit into the collar and it's measuring uh, the three dimensions of an animal's body plane, the up and down, right here Z, um, is up and down movement, sway back and forth and forward and backwards by the X axis. So 16 times a second, these collars are measuring activity patterns of cougars. And we can pull this data off the cooler, uh, off the collar, and see these really 
fascinating behavioral profiles. Here's data uh, from a caller during of M201 when he killed an elk. Here he is stalking. You can see very low movement here. And then here's the surge that we can identify when he pounces onto an animal and kills it. And then the feeding behavior here where you see the axes flipping as they're turning their heads side to side to chew and eat. And so this data is a really powerful way we can essentially put these collars out on the animal, collect data over the course of a couple of years and identify these surges and count how many times they pounced on an animal and kill followed by feeding behavior versus how many times they pounced and it wasn't following by feeding behavior. So we're really excited. This is part of Colby Anton's recent PhD work. We have these acceler accelerometer collars on both wolves and cougars. And here's a cougar. Again, you can see the kill surge down here in the lower left. Here's the feeding behavior. And this is what travel looks like. And then we can do the same thing with wolves. Of course, wolves doesn't have as tight of a surge because imagine a wolf coming onto an elk, running a lot. Uh, it's not a quick pounce. So you see this really different behavioral profile. But this technology is a really powerful way to study wolf and cougar behaviors from these collars. And with cougars even, because it's been calibrated with captive cougars, wearing these collars on a treadmill measuring oxygen consumption, we can actually take these measures from our data on Yellowstone and calculate the calories that are being expended throughout a cougar's life, whether it's traveling, hunting, feeding, raising offspring. And, and we can also then measure the amount of calories being taken in by how many animals are killing and what the biomass is. So it's a really exciting new phase of the research that we have ongoing. So just to end here, we're continuing to do population estimation. That study I described went through 2017. Uh, we now have a remote camera grid trap across the Northern Range, and we have GPS collar cougars together, and we're gonna be starting the genetic surveys again. And using these, uh, these techniques combined, we're gonna continue our, at periodic times throughout the future years, estimating Yellowstone cougars numbers, uh, and then we'll continue to do outreach and education. I will make one final pitch here. We've been working hard as our team uh, for quite a few years here. Jim Halfpenny helped with this, other folks. We had over 70 contributors to this effort. Uh, but this book will be available in November of 2020 through University of Chicago Press. We do talk about multi-carnivore interactions in one of the chapters in this book. We're really excited to get this out there for folks. To, it's us telling the story of Yellowstone wolves, synthesizing our science, uh, and understanding how carnivores uh, play a role in this ecosystem. So keep your eyes open for that. It can be pre-ordered now on Amazon uh, for a heck of a deal, 35 bucks. And we hope you all go out there and buy this and, uh, and learn more about what we've done here in Yellowstone. And with that, I just want to thank uh, the folks that have helped contributed. There's a lot of volunteer technicians over the years, but Colby Anton is now Dr. Anton. He did some great work and, and keep your eyes open for some papers coming out from him. And Connor Meyer, Wes Binder are two of my main techs right now. Uh, Justin Duffy is my houndsman out of Livingston, just a, a really talented, uh, uh, caring guy about cougars, passionate. And uh, we couldn't do the work without these folks. So, um, and then our funders there. So with that, uh, I can guess I'll take